Welcome everyone. This is Improving the Quality of Wheelchair Service in Columbia through a national educational initiative. I am Nancy Augustine and I will be moderating today's session. I will provide the CEU code at the end. Um, before we get started, please remember to mute yourself. You can ask questions using the chat feature and we'll be providing those questions to Sarah throughout the session. Uh, now I'm pleased to turn it over to Sarah Munera, who is your presenter today. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session. Thank you very much for joining uh, this one, particularly with all of the amazing ones that we have available. So I really appreciate all of you being here. As Nancy just told you, I'm going to talk about how we have working to improve the quality of wheelchair services in Colombia through a national educational initiative. And on the screen, you can see the pictures of my friends and co-workers who have been working with me and with the whole country in this initiative. They are Fabian Pedraza, Dina Marcela Flores, Freddy Alfonso Diaz, and myself. And I have two screens, so I will be looking at here and at here as well. So after two years of pandemic and everything virtual, I'm pretty sure we all know how to uh, work on Zoom, but just in case, remember that you can turn on and off your camera and your microphone, that you can look at the list of participants and you can also write in the chat. And I will definitely love to see you all. Now that we were not able to meet in person, I will love to see you virtually. So if it is possible for you to turn your camera on, that will be amazing, just so I know you are there and it's not just me talking like a crazy, crazy person here. Thank you, Anna. Hi. And another way for me to know that you are there and that you are engaged is the reactions that it's on the bottom portion of your Zoom. So you can click right there when, when, where it says reactions and you have two pretty cool features that I love, which, is, which are like a faster uh, arrow and a slower arrow. So you can ask me to go faster or to slow down if necessary, then hesitate to use that. I know that my accent is awesome. So if you don't understand anything, ask me to uh, repeat that or, or go slower and I will definitely do that. And you also have different reactions such as uh, applauses or hearts or laughs or a lot of different things that you can play with uh, while we are here today. So I would like uh, to start by hearing from you in the chat. Please let me know your country and what you have been doing to support wheelchair service provision when you work, where you work. So feel free to do that uh, on the chat. You can also unmute yourself and share. And I'm going to open the chat here. Hi, Arriba. Hi, Joali. Hi, Laura. Thank you for turning your cameras on. So we have Laura from Colombia. We have uh, Laura takes, takes different courses in wheelchair provision. Amazing. Alba from Dominican Republic, which has been doing a lot of different activities to improve um, wheelchair service provision there as well. We have Maria Camila from Colombia as well. Eleni from based in New York City is the chair of Resma International Special Interest Group. Great to have you here, Eleni. From Colorado, hi Rich, how are you, Anna? From Brazil, she is the Resna inter. It works at, or is involved with the Resna International uh, Special Interest Group. Outcome implementation in Latin America. So a lot of amazing things as well to support wheelchair service provision in our region. Joel is from Mexico and has been working supporting training in wheelchair service provision. Mary is there from Pittsburgh and working with the International Society of Wheelchair Professionals. Frank from New, from New York, PT in public schools. How cool, Frank. Amazing. So it's great to meet you all and to understand a little bit of what you are doing to support uh, wheelchair service in where you work. And Matthew, executive director of the Demeter Group. I hope I pronounced that acronym correctly, Matthew, in Oregon, super. So I'm not sure if this qualifies as a conflict of interest, but I just wanted to let you know that I have been working uh, in Colombia in the development and implementations of all of the strategies that I'm going to share with you today. 
Um, initially, I am going to give some context about Colombia, who we are, and then I'm going to focus on the different activities that we have been doing in this national effort. So Colombia is an upper middle income country in the north of South America. We have a population of 50.3 million people and over 50, over 25% of our population lives in poverty. Our official language is Spanish and Colombian sign language. And we also have 66 additional native languages. Most of our population, that is 94.74%, um, is covered by a mandatory healthcare plan. And the military forces has a, a special, have a special health system for militaries and for their families. Unfortunately, we have had 60 years of armed conflict in our country that have left over 8.5 million victims, 7.9 million displaced people, and 12,074 line mine victims. So you can imagine that that is a lot of people with disabilities that we have in our country due to this conflict. We are a democratic country with advanced rights for people with disabilities. And these rights are evidenced through various legislations, including our 1991 constitution, our national disability assessment system and the enhancement on the, of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So as I just mentioned, the country has a national disability inclusion policy. This document was developed with a participatory approach, which means that people with disabilities were part of the process of the development and there, as well as their representatives, organizations and families. This document is centered in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and on the social model of disability. And it has replaced the previous public policies that promoted a focus on the social management of risk when addressing disability. However, there are a lot of challenges remaining to make Colombian society a society in which persons with disabilities are effectively included and their rights fully guaranteed. guaranteed. So in practice, people with disabilities continue to have poorer outcomes compared to those without disabilities, such as limited access to health, education, employment, among others. People can access our mandatory healthcare system in two ways. If they work, then they pay to be part of our healthcare system and they are part of the contributory group. And if they cannot work, they don't have the means to pay, so they are subsidized for those who can pay. So they are part of the subsidized um, part of our healthcare system. So 42% of the general population are affiliated to the subsidized health system, and 48% are part of the contributory system. But for people with disabilities, 70% are affiliated to the subsidized health system, and only 30% are part of the contributory one. So you can start seeing the discrepancies between the general population and those with disabilities. Additionally, persons with disabilities face a healthcare system that has therapeutic dispersion. So it is really difficult for a person to have the same physician throughout their life or even throughout the same year on one appointment to the other one. They have different uh, healthcare providers. It is difficult to access a specialized care when necessary and they perceived an administrative and procedure, different administrative and procedural barriers to access services. There is also a lack of training in healthcare to meet the needs of people with disabilities, and that of course aggravates this issue. So as I mentioned, in 2011, Colombia ratified the United Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and created a national disability system and public policy regarding disability. As we all know, the UNCRPD states that mobility is a human right, so access to an appropriate wheelchair and related services are also a human right. But unfortunately, as of today, wheelchairs are excluded from the national health care plan. So we have uh, four, five different ways to access wheelchairs in our country. The first one is through a legal mechanism via a court appeal. So not having access to a wheelchair is considered a violation of the right to health. So to access a prescribed wheelchair, 
uh, paid for by the government, the prescription needs to be done by a physician. Then the user will take that prescription to the healthcare system and the healthcare system will take the user. We are very, really sorry, bad wheelchairs, but we don't pay for wheelchairs. So with that uh, denial, the user will have to go to a court and explain to a judge that without accessing an appropriate wheelchair, he or she will not have access to healthcare. Uh, and in that way, the legislation system will ensure that the healthcare system actually gives a wheelchair to the user. I know that is crazy, it is how it works. And it can take up to two years or even five years for a person to go through all of these um, crazy system to access a wheelchair paid for by the government. Additionally, prescriptions are not always accurate or adequate, and we will see why in a second. Another way to get wheelchairs is through subsidies by the government. For that, for that you have to uh, come from a low-income family, and you only get a wheelchair once a year, but not always delivered with appropriate services. The third way is through a special social security system that the military has. They prescribe the wheelchair by an interdisciplinary team and they do have assistive technology provision guidelines that, that needs to be followed if you're going to get a wheelchair through this system. The fourth mechanism is out of pocket. You pay for whatever you can pay for and that's what you get but not necessarily you get what you need. So it's not necessarily the appropriate wheelchair. And the fifth one is charity through massive donations that it's one size fits all type of wheelchair. I see we have a comment here in the chat from Eleni. In the US, people with disabilities also sometimes need to go to court to get their wheelchair. That's so interesting, Eleni. I had no idea that worked there similar as well. Thank you for letting us know. So that was regarding healthcare. In relation to education, 37.9% of people with disabilities only finish primary school. And while 33.8% did not finish any grade, 20.5% finished high school, while only 1.7% completed university education. And with this rate of university completion in a country that highly values diplomas, you can imagine how challenging it is for someone to get access to a decent job. So that was a little bit about the situation um, in general in Colombia and particularly for those with disabilities. I would like you to look around for an object that identifies you and then show it to the camera. If you have your camera on, you can also turn it on briefly um, or you can type in the chat what you have around that identifies you and as you do i would like you to share how different is the situation for people with disability in colombia in your country i mean when compared to um, the situation of those with disabilities in colombia so look around something that identifies you and i'll drink a bit of water in the meantime. I love everyone looking around and I see Johali has a our post-its, of course. <laughs> Would you like to share? And Mary has AirPods. Super Mary, thanks. Laura has oh a valid by Marina right and edward has earphones as well and i will arriba i'm not sure oh a candle love it and how about you rich i bet it's full of coffee <laughs> super would any one of you like to share i and ali just oh my gosh look at that Go baby, go from Anna, of course. Super, thank you all. Will any one of you like to share if the situation for those with disabilities 
is different and how in your country when compared to what I just shared? Well, I can say about the Go Baby Go project. So here we, in the United States, we say that the Go Baby Go, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's easy to adapt. It's easy to have because it, the, because it's a, it's an accessible cost. And, and then if you want to buy the same car in Brazil, it's not the case. You know, it's not a cheap toy. Um, yes, you may be, you may be able to modify, but even like if you want to buy the AbleNet joystick, it's very expensive. So it kind of defeats the, it's not the same reality. So if you want to use the same car, the same joystick, the same, <clears throat> the same joystick, no, sorry, the same switch, the, then the price would be a limiting factor. Why we we'll say here easy to access and cheap is not the same reality in Brazil, if we would say that. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. And, and it's great because you were able to compare like two different locations, right? And here in Colombia, we also have a Go Baby Go program, uh, but we have to do everything from scratch. So instead of buying the AbleNet switch, we have to create the switch because it's super expensive. So it's really interesting how uh, even though we can find similar ways to solve an issue due to the different realities and the products we have available and so on, it's, it's different and we have to adapt and, and make modifications. Thank you. Alba, did I, did I see your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, I would say there are some similarities between Colombia and Dominican Republic um, based on what you just said about the health system um not guaranteeing continuity of the services and also about the situation on inclusion that later limits uh how what can i access uh, we have very low inclusion inclusion in school and work and we also have two um, health schemes in social security uh, subsidized and uh contributory and of course people with disabilities are uh fair more in the, in the subsidized one because of the lack of access to education and proper work later. Thank you, thank you. So we can see some similarities there, but of course you have a legislation that recently included wheelchairs uh, to be paid for by the government, right? And hopefully we will get there soon in Colombia. Um, Eleni also shared, um, that sometimes people also go to a court in the US. I'm assuming it's for probably some special rehab equipment. Would you like to tell us more about it? Yeah, sometimes if they have um, like a, a government funded insurance, for example, uh, through their state, one of the 50 states, they're, all the states are supposed to have Medicare, or if it's federal through the United States government, Medi all the states are supposed to have Medicaid, or if it's federal through Medicare, and the person that's reviewing their claims keeps denying it, but technically it is considered a covered item, they can go to court and they can fight it in court. You usually have to get two, three denials before you can take it to court. It's called a fair hearing. A lot of times by the time they get to court, they will overturn it, but it adds unnecessary time to the process and certainly some anxiety and strain for the client who just wishes they could get their equipment the first time. Um, Definitely, thank you for sharing. And like anxiety, because if you don't get your equipment, then you will have to stay at home or not go to school or won't be able to go to work or so many um, challenges due to not having an appropriate wheelchair or any other assistive technology. So the, in this slide, we can see another group of friends and co-workers, Magda Susana Roman, Maria Luisa Toro, Cristian Moreno and Juan Fernando Celis. And we worked together to understand access to assistive technology in Colombia a couple of years ago. We found that, that there was an overall lack of systems thinking approach with most of the legislation re regarding assistive products. We also found that there was little reflection of the policies implementation in reality, that assistive technology users felt that they and their families lack information about assistive products and related policies in place that unfortunately appropriately informed professionals on this topic uh, on this topic as well as service delivery system are not a common practice 
and that few providers actually have a user-centered services. Additionally, the healthcare coverage, as I mentioned, denies financing for these products, which results in a legal appeal by the user. So often people with disabilities rely on donation of products or out of pocket approaches. And this situation is even more challenging for those who live outside of the cities or municipalities. So those living in the rural areas. We have also found that rehabilitation professionals lack the necessary skills to deliver appropriate wheelchairs. So this research study asked 116 last year physical therapy students from two universities in Colombia to take the International Society of Wheelchair Professionals basic test on wheelchair service provision. And none of them, none, <laughs> passed the test. And then another study asked 83 occupational therapy students from seven universities to take the test with the same results, no one passed. So these two researchers has helped us advocate on the need to Im implement wheelchair content in uh, education into rehabilitation curricula. So that's what I wanted to share regarding Colombia. And if you want to learn more about our people and how we are super loud and full of music and colors and some of the challenges we have faced and how courageously we have faced them. You can watch Encanto by Disney. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> super. Now I will just um, talk about this national effort to improve the quality of wheelchair service. Um, and here you can see a timeline of all the different activities we have followed, as well as the support from national stakeholders and international organizations. And I will explain each on a sec. And I'm looking at a comment from Mary, loving it and on repeat in our house. I know I've seen it two times already. I'm going to the third one. <laughs> we don't talk about Bruno Alpha, you're totally right. Super. So in 2018, the Ministry of Health requested the National, Health, the National System of Education in Colombia, that's called SENA, the development of a training program that could allow national wheelchair manufacturer in order to improve access to this product and related services. So in this year, the government realized that they were having a lot of issues with this legal appeal system, delivering wheelchairs that they didn't know were appropriate. And they thought that the way to solve this issue was to create a, pro a program that will allow them to manufacture locally different wheelchairs. So this national system of education, it's called SENA, and they are training for free in every country of our corner. So as you can see in the picture, all of those white dots are the different training centers they have. They have 117 in all the region, especially in those islands that you can see on the top, that's pretty far away and they are there. So it's super important, uh, the, the role of this stakeholder in order to give uh, education for free to Colombians. And I'm looking at the chat. Sara, would you please describe the current prescription and provision process? Gracias, Rich. Yes, I will. Um, yes. So, so current, I will. Okay, no. So currently, um, a user needs to go to a, a physician, general physician, general doctor, and he or she will send the user to a physiatrist, physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. This person will evaluate the user in around 30 to 40 minutes and prescribe a wheelchair. In some other cases, the, this person, the physiatrist will uh, ask for a prescription to a mobility, um, to a mobility group. So we will have their different therapists, physicians, uh, PTs, OTs. And Laura says sometimes they only have 20 minutes to evaluate and provide a prescription. That is correct. Thank you, Laura. Um, so if they only have they only have 20 to 40 minutes to write the make the evaluation and write the prescription or send this user to an interprofessionally um, board 
to be evaluated and then to have a prescription. And then with this prescription, they will go through this legal appeal process that will take between six months to two or even five years. So with a system um, not working on an appropriate way, as I mentioned, they thought the solution to all of this is to have wheelchairs produced by local manufacturers and we will be all set. So fortunately, Sena um, requested some support from the committee of the Red Cross Colombia delegation, ICRC call. And they proposed the visit of an international expert from the NGO Motivation UK in order to assess the potential of Sena to offer such a training program considering the context of the country and our needs. So the subject matter expert for motivation recommended that Sena could create this program and a program that was similar to uh, the one that they have in TADCA to the certificate course in wheelchair technology from the Tanzania Training Center for Orthopedic Technologies. And this, this expert also recognized that this program can support the current prosthetics and orthotics program that Sena has and that they that the country should also work in a national manufacturer standard based on international examples and that it was important to develop a wheelchair associations association so importers and local manufacturers can be involved in governmental discussions around this topic so in order to better understand how this training program works a group of representatives from both icrc coal and sena and a local manufacturer went to TATCO. So this trip allowed them to see an important opportunity to develop professional training, particularly with a modular approach, but also helped them to understand that there was no necessary link between increasing local manufacture and improving access to wheelchair if other elements such as training, regulation of products and services were not tackled. So we are now one year um, from this initial uh, activity in 2019. And I'm looking at another comment in the chat from Joali. Was funding needed to have the content expert visit the country and conduct the assessment? I'm pretty sure the funding for this activity was in charge of ICRC delegation Colombia. So they were, they were the ones that uh, bring this person and also the ones that supported the trip from ICRC, SENA, and the local manufacturer to that cut. So based on these recommendations from uh, the expert as well as from the, uh, from the trip, we're shaping a more systems thinking approach to this topic. So in order to include other organizations and stakeholders, we held a mobility national workshop and a stakeholders meeting in November of 2019. And we, a Colombian company working in assistive technology education, which I'm proudly the founder, was invited to facilitate this meeting with ICRC, Call, and Sena. So the design of this workshop allowed participants to discuss how wheelchair delivery, wheelchair quality, training, education, and partnerships work in the country and to find facilitators and barriers for each. There were two previous stakeholders meeting held in 2017 and 2018, but these were held on different parts of the region. The one from 2019 was held in Bogota, the capital of the country. And this one was the first one to have representation from the government, as well as from education, educators, rehabilitation centers, local vendors and importers. So here you can see some pictures of the event. We first had a short presentation on the systems thinking approach, and then we decided to work in different groups. So each group had two prompts. The first one is to think about wheelchair service provision in Colombia, how it works, and to make a comparison between the WHO eight steps and the step that we follow in our country. So that, that's exactly what Rich just um, asked about. So here we have, and I cannot point, but in the first picture we have in black, the, the WHO eight steps. 
and then in red, the way it works in Colombia. And one of the main things we notice is that um, court or this legal appeal or the legal system was part of this, like heavily part of it, which didn't make a lot of sense since these are no rehabilitation professionals that truly understand the user needs or if the prescription is appropriate. So after they worked on this, um, they looked at different challenges for each of these steps that are not working appropriately and brainstorm on solutions to tackle these challenges. So then we had a break in which facilitators look at the different solutions and we group them by service regulation, product regulation, partnerships and education. And then everyone came together and we asked them to join groups based on their expertise to think on different ways to develop these solutions. So here are some of the main outcomes of this national workshop. So we get a deeper understanding of how wheelchair service provision works in the country. So it's not working in an appropriate order. Sometimes the prescription is done before the evaluation. I know it sounds crazy, but sometimes it happens that way. And it's because since the physician only has, has 20 minutes to prescribe the wheelchair and to understand if the user, um, I don't know, it's taking appropriate care of their skin or if he or she is going to school or if they need any other support. So only 20 to 40 minutes to all of that. Sometimes they don't have time to actually evaluate the user. So we'll, they will just prescribe a wheelchair with some characteristics. We do not take measurements at this time. So after all this legal appeal craziness, when the user actually has the order of the judge for the healthcare system to give him or her the wheelchair, the user will go um, to the healthcare system and only then they will take measurements. And sometimes at this point, they will realize that the prescription was not appropriate and they will have to go back. Um, another important uh, thing that we notice is that rehabilitation practitioners are not appropriately trained. And I just uh, show you the two different studies to support this. And I'm pretty sure that we, if we do uh, the same study with physical therapy and rehabilitation last year as students, the results will be pretty similar. And so the evaluation is done differently by different professionals since we don't have a standardized way of getting trained. There is no clear path funding, funding path to access wheelchairs in our country and the service provision is fragmented. So sometimes the physician that prescribed you your wheelchair is not the same one that is going to see you two or three months. So we, are, we don't have a way of knowing if the prescription and thus wheelchair is appropriate for the user or not. And we also don't have a way to evaluate the quality of the products that we have. Uh, and Rich, I just noted, you noticed your comment. That is what I was wondering. Do you mean about the path to access a wheelchair? Sorry, I didn't notice that earlier. So we also found a specific activities that should be helped to improve wheelchair service. So we thought that service regulation should be made based on the WHO eight steps for wheelchair service provision, and particularly based on the different roles of rehabilitation professionals. We also thought that a product regulation should be in place and that stakeholders should work together to have a common language regarding wheelchair service provision. It was about the prescription happening before the evaluation. Yeah, it's crazy. So as a group, looking at all this, we decided that education was uh, a fundamental first step that we wanted to tackle. So during that same month, in November 2019, we had another stakeholder meeting, uh, this time focused on education. So to understand the different skills and knowledge that were needed by all of those who were part of wheelchair service provision based on the WHO eight steps and to brainstorm in training modalities and existing courses that were available. So um, academic and non-academic stakeholders were part of this meeting. We had universities offering rehabilitation uh, sciences, 
such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, prosthetics and orthotics. And we also have wheelchair providers, which include local and international vendors that provide training and are an important uh, portion of training for in our country and Latin America in general. So uh, as, as facilitators, um, we prepared a document for each group that had all the different roles that a stakeholders had, well, not all the different, but some of the roles that a stakeholders uh, held in wheelchair service provision. So we have one document for manufacturers, designers, and technicians, another document for clinician, another document for importers or distributors, and one for administrators. And we listed the role and then the eight, the WHO eight steps. And we asked the group to add all the knowledge and skills that each of these uh, roles were going to need for all of those steps. And then we asked them if we already have courses to support that type of training, or if we didn't have those courses available either in our country or internationally, then what were the resources that were going to be necessary? Uh, based on this, different education curricula is going to be developed for technicians, for clinicians, and for wheelchair service administrators. And a subgroup is already working on moving this forward. And then 2019 came the COVID pandemic <laughs> and all of our activities get paused. So it was interesting because as you can see, the pace was moving really fast towards the end. So in November, we had two super productive meetings and we, were, we had a plan to move forward during 2020. And then of course, life changes for all of us. <laughs> And then this year, in August 2021, the Direction of Medical Devices and the Office of Social Promotion of the Ministry of Health is starting developing a manual of good practice and sanitary requirements for wheelchair service provision in Colombia. And these manuals open, opens the door for regulation of products, services, and personnel. So they have done this work based on a previous experience they had when regulated orthopedic devices for external use, such as orthosis and prosthosis. And this work of creating uh, the regulation for PNO um, created then a legislation that is called the Res Resolution 2968. And as a result, SENA created a curriculum to train personnel based on ISPOS standards and design a specific environments to support this training in different regions of our country. So the government thought it was a really interesting process and wanted to do something similar for wheelchairs. So from October to December, we held 11 meetings uh, with the Ministry of Health. They requested different wheelchair stakeholders to review the manual, to give feedback and to agree on a future legislation based on the manual to be issued and implemented with the within the next couple of years. So we can see some of the pictures. Uh, the way it works is that we all read the document, explain our concerns, and then we talked about it. So this uh, manual of good practice and sanitary requirements for wheelchair service provision is not yet available. Um, it's going to be published within the next couple of uh, months, but I can let you know that it will include um, information regarding the different roles and the different certifications those working in wheelchair service provision should have. And these um, certifications are based on the International Society of Wheelchair Professional Certification Program, which is super amazing. So for us, that was an amazing. Uh, quantum leap to start requesting to develop a training program in 2018. And now to having a national agenda that is moving forward with different stakeholders talking the same language with a manual of good practice and sanitary requirements for wheelchair service provision with certificate requirements for those wor working in wheelchair service provision and with an educational group that has been um, leading the effort to improve education and training. So I would like to see in the chat if you have any other actions uh, in mind that we can take to keep moving forward the wheelchair sector in Colombia. And if you have any other comments of quest or questions at this time, feel free to either put them on the chat or unmute yourself.
Thank you, Alba. I saw the clapping hands. <laughs> So Eleni is asking if the certificate requirement for wheelchair practitioner uh, is through ISWP. Yes. So this was based, Eleni, on the last um, legislation the government created in which the trainer organization or for PNOs, for prosthetics and orthotic uh, professionals, need to be compliant with ISPO certification standards. So when we came to the discussion regarding wheelchairs, we were asking what is the body that should uh, allow for appropriate standards? Because that's, as you can see, one of our main issues that we don't have a similar way of, of looking at this. And we don't have a, a basis or common understanding regarding how we should evaluate and what should we evaluate. So we um, decided as a group that the International Society of Wheelchair Professional Certification was the way to go to um, all different wheelchair service providers. And then Mary says, since there is such a great interest in several of the universities and academic training that focuses on AP, oh, I love it. I'm gonna take pictures of this. And then Anna, I would love to know if you have any outcome measures validate and translate to Colombian Spanish. And it is part of the training that clinicians should use to encourage the user assessment. So I know what we currently use is based on WHO um, packages and ISWP certification. We do not have anything particularly translated to, to Colombia. And I think um, outcome measures are like a next step <laughs> where we have that in our, I don't know, mid future because we are still trying to, to get commonalities on some of the, of the basic things. Rich says, great work, Sarah, you are making progress after so many years of being agile. Rich, thank you. I'm not gonna keep reading. And then Ariva, can you expand on how you started this movement before your request? Ah, yes, Ariva, I will show that in a second we should have more interaction between the people that work in wheelchair provision to learn from others point of view and knowledge that is totally right Laura thank you great example of co-working between INGO ICRC and motivation education institute and professional growth thank you for Christopher and I will take a picture of these thank you all <laughs> So I will I go to Ariva's point in one second. I just wanted to share some of the key elements uh, that we have seen as well as the lessons learned. So I think that the government and other stakeholders involvement has been fundamental to actually, actually have this national effort to improve wheelchair services. So for this to become part of a national agenda and to work from different perspectives instead of, instead of just focusing all efforts in one specific topic with low impact for wheelchair users, I think the involvement of different stakeholders and the systems thinking approach was super important. And one of the things that we have learned as well is the pace of implementation of different uh, projects or activities are based on the availability and agendas of different stakeholders. And then as I was looking at this yesterday, I came upon this presentation that I did in 2017, when I was starting my master's in rehab science and technology at the University of Pittsburgh. And I, with Dr. Parman and Maria Toro, we talk about people, policies, products, and provision in Colombia, and proposed a strategy to move uh, the wheelchair sector forward. And we said that we were going to have our first stakeholder meeting. Uh, and as I just mentioned, we took three to actually create a change. We said that we wanted to advocate with the Institute of Technology. Uh, we did that with not a lot of uh, results. Probably we will see those results in a couple of years. So I think that part of the conclusion is that plans are changing constantly based on the space of implementation and based on 
different, um, as I mentioned, agendas or needs for different stakeholders. But I'm pretty sure that if we know where we're going as a country, if we know what we want to improve I, and why we want to do it, then even though it is not through the path that we originally planned, we will get there, right? And it wasn't in um, 2018, but in 2021, 2022, that we are like creating change. So I think that was amazing to see a presentation yesterday. So some of the challenges, of course, COVID-19 modified the priorities of our government. Um, and once again, based on the government agenda, they needed to have this new legislation as soon as possible. So that's why we had 11 meetings in two months uh, during the last months of the year, like the first day of the novena, which is some religious thing here in Colombia. We were in a meeting um, that was crazy. Um, and another challenge is to actually um, implement this international vision to our local activities. So even though all of the workshops are all of the activities have been based on international standards, we talk about WHO, ISWP, RESNA, we bring all these amazing uh, pay, position papers and so on. We have a different way of understanding disability and of understanding assistive technology. So when you explain, when you want to explain to a healthcare system that a wheelchair doesn't um, only allow health, but also education and so on. And I know it happens something similar in the US. So it's really challenging. And it has been difficult to actually implement those international standards and this international way of thinking within our national level. So I like to think on the systems thinking approach framework as a puzzle. And there are some pieces of the puzzle that are strengthened and that we have been working more on and that are bigger, such as policy, the creation of this new manual, such as partnerships is amazing that most of the people that work in the winter sector in Colombia already know each other. We have been working in personnel, understanding the different roles and the different knowledge and skills they should have. We have talked about the pace of implementation of these changes. We have discussed the different places in which um, users access assistive technology and how this changes. But unfortunately, this was not um, this is not seen in the policy. So even though we know those living in rural areas have more challenges to access wheelchairs, there is no information regarding that on the legislation. We still have to work on the promotion, how we promote wheelchairs, how we talk about these devices, what biases do we have regarding this type of products. We also have to work more, more with the product itself, with international regulation, understanding quality, understanding the procurement process that our government and different stakeholders are going to take. And unfortunately, people with disabilities, wheelchair users, have not been in the center of this process. So the government, um, when they did uh, the different meetings in order to create the manual, they did invite um, wheelchair users and wheelchair users organizations, but their uh, participation was not as expected or necessary in order to actually be part, be part of this. And we have also have to talk in the wheelchair provision in the WHO eight steps um, way of accessing wheelchair in order to actually have an adequate path for users to access. So that's what I wanted to share with you. You have our email address on that slide and with that education, it's uh, the Instagram for we, my company. So feel free to contact there. And I think we have more time for comments or questions. Thanks very much, Sarah. So we do have a couple of minutes for questions before we provide the CEU code for today's session. So Sarah. Question. 
Oh, um, maybe I should have raised my hand. I'm sorry. So uh, my name's Eleni and I'm an OT. I, my, I work at Permobile as a clinical education manager, but I also volunteer with Resna as the chair of their international special interest group. And we've been hearing for years, people interested in getting the ATP exam translated into Spanish and utilizing that as a um, certification type of tool outside of the US and Canada. Um, Resna has, has yet to do that, but um, I'm so happy that ISWP exists and their tools are available in a range of languages. Was that, I'm just curious, was that something you explored trying to go through Resna and it didn't work out and you went to ISWP or ISWP's resources really matched what Columbia was looking to build better? Um, That's a great curious. question, Eleni, I like it, yeah. And, and I actually have volunteered translating some of the Resna tools into Spanish. So oh, we definitely Thank have you. a connection there. Um, I do think we didn't explore other options. We just like saw ISPO and immediately thought ISWP, like that was the translation. I do think there are some challenges to get a RESNA certification in, in some of our countries. The main one, it's how expensive it is for us who don't um, mm. earn in dollars. <laughs> yeah. And the second one, I think it's the, the way you access the evaluation, like with the website and, and all that. So, but, but that is not something we, we looked at at the time. Okay. And I'm, I'm so you. happy you found something that worked for you. Thanks. Okay, I think I tried, I raised my hand there. I think it worked. But so, Sarah, I, you know, like I have some initiatives uh, working in Brazil too. And one of the things that I, like you said, I think the cultural, um, tr trying to transpose everything that has an international to our culture is a little challenging, like you said, because it does not apply. So I think, um, I don't know, like I just want to, you know, like, if you, when you, this guideline is ready, that the, the, the process that you guys are working, because when you were talking about, you know, like the public and the private and how you get the wheelchairs. So even though we are, it, it, our countries have no answer and they're different, it's still like in the bigger picture, very similar. So if, I don't know how, maybe Argentina, maybe other countries are also like towards this, but maybe something that we can, could think about it, being like Latin America, uh, if this if this is a guideline that is going to be published, you know, if you share with others and see how the process was established and things that you learn of using the ISWP and maybe how can we each one each this the, of the groups that would be interested in participating, how can we culturally adapt to this? Because I think that's one of the biggest um, challenges that we face with outcomes, right? They can be translated into Portuguese or Spanish, but do they really represent that culture, that country? So I think if, you know, like the, today we have the, the happy hour Latin America, maybe that would be a nice way to us to even talk about price, cost, access to conferences like this. You know, so like this year, Felipe Correa and I were in the advisory board and we were like, okay, Resna, you know, had a, a, a scale for prices, let's do this too. So like we want, we want to, people that are, have some more access than others, we want to include everybody. So I think this discussion is, should be continued, you know, like access to education that many like you, yours, that is very similar, I'm sure, to Brazil, but Chile, Peru, like you, we all have the same um, social barriers, right? In, in like poverty and access to care. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm fascinated and thank you so much for your work. And I- Thank you, um, Anna, thanks. And that is, thanks, and that is definitely a great idea, like to share what we have done. And that's why I um, added like extra details on what we did on each of the meetings and like the different steps and like we collect the data in this way and then we divided the groups and so on because I think it's, it can be uh, done in, in different contexts as well. And I will definitely let you, let you know once we have the manual uh, ready to be published or published. Okay, uh, so why don't I take this opportunity to provide the CEU code for this session, which is DP2T. 
T3, DP2, DT3. And I just put it in the chat as well. But we certainly have about five more minutes to continue the conversation. Thank you, Nancy. Sarah, would you like to stay on for a few more minutes in case anyone would like to? Yes, to definitely. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> Thank you all. Sarah, since there are still some people on and, and you can weigh in on this too, to I think both Anna's point and Eleni's point about RESNA and the integration with ISWP and other organizations. I think RESNA is very interested in looking at these pathway programs to try to increase more ATPs worldwide, so both within the U.S. and globally. And we've had conversations, so I met with Elisa Brownlee and Andrea Van Hook, so the Resna Professional Standards Board Chair and the Executive Director and proposed this concept that the WSP from ISWP might fit really nicely, right, with the ATP because it's this very basic fundamental do no harm um, as a pathway. And Perry Lowe, who, you know, has done a lot of work in this area too, has, and also happens to be a Resna board member, has used his spot to try to advocate this also. So I think it's part of the overall discussion in the community, but trying to understand how it best fits and what the value proposition is for both Fresna and other organizations, like what that model is, how do they work together, are the pieces like devils in the details, I guess, right, is what they say. So it's a little bit difficult to implement, um, but I think is part of the conversation. And I do think it's, it's a great idea because like different certifi certifications can improve um, your work as a therapist in different ways, right? So if you need this international approach or are living in a lower or middle income country, then probably ISWP, it's like what you need. But if you can, based on that access to ATP or SMS, I think that's amazing. And same the same way or the other way around. Like if you are already an ATP but want to do more international work, then having this extra information regarding context and how to work in different settings can serve you as well. So I think it will be great to like to keep that discussion on, on how to support the, the promotion of different certifications. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, we have about two minutes left. So I, if we have one more brief question, we could take that. Otherwise, I think we'll start to close the session at this point. But thank you so much, it was terrific. Thank you all.